Hello and welcome to this edition of World at War. My name is Mohammed Saleh. A top secret Chinese space plane that was launched just last week into the orbit has set off alarm bells in the military establishment of the United States. Dubbed the Shenlong, which means the divine dragon in Chinese. This mystery space plane was launched by Beijing on the 14th of December from the Jiuquan Satellite Launch Center in the Gobi Desert using the Long March 2F rocket. Once in orbit, this mystery space plane is reported to be sending signals to a hidden ground station or a ship near the North American West Coast. Sharp emissions to the tune of 2,280 megahertz have been detected as the Chinese space plane has been tracked zipping over British Columbia in Canada. But the question is this, what really is this mystery space plane but China up to? If you rely on the official Chinese announcements, then this space plane is merely for technical support for the peaceful use of space. The United States Space Force, which is the space service branch of the US Armed Forces, is also very closely tracking the Chinese space plane. But it has so far remained very tight-lipped about the suspicious activities of Shenlong. But Scott Tilley, an amateur astronomer who helped NASA track down its long-lost image satellite in 2018, has made some very interesting observations about what this Chinese space plane is up to. What is definitively known about this Chinese space plane is that it has released a total of five other mysterious objects once it entered into the orbit. The US Department of Defense has designated the Chinese space plane and the five other objects as object A to F. The main Chinese space plane is object A. Object B is said to be very bright and has shown characteristics associated with an upper stage rocket. Object C appears to be a rapidly spinning faint piece of debris, while objects D and E are suspected to be satellites, while object F is quite faint with no rotation that has been detected so far. Space planes are unique. They incorporate features of both spacecraft and aircraft. So far, all space planes, even in their concept stage, are rocket-powered for their takeoff and climb. But they have to land as unpowered gliders. The United States, too, operates something very similar to the Chinese spy plane, the Boeing-manufactured X-37B. The X-37B began as a NASA project back in 1999. But in 2004, it was taken over by the Department of Defense. The X-37B made its very first orbital flight back in 2010 and has so far completed a total of six missions. In its most recent mission, the X-37B was launched on an Atlas V rocket in May 2020. And it stayed in a trajectory around planet Earth till November 2022 and orbited Earth for a total of 908 days. The seventh mission of X-37B is planned towards the end of December. The only other nation to have had a space plane program apart from China and the United States is Russia. Conceptualized in the erstwhile Soviet Union in 1980, the Soviet Buran made its very first flight back in 1988. But in 2002, the Russian Buran got destroyed when its storage hangar suddenly collapsed. The Chinese Divine Dragon and the American X-37B are the most closely tracked objects whenever they fly in the sky. But what is interesting is that despite the fact that they are so closely tracked, very little is known in concrete terms about the operations that are carried out by the two superpowers using their space planes. When a Chinese spy balloon was found floating over the American skies in January 2023, it created a political storm in the United States. An F-22 Raptor was called in to shoot down the offending Chinese balloon, which the Chinese claimed was meant only for research purposes. The fact that satellites are used for spying is well known. And at this moment, Although there is no official count on the number of military satellites that are deployed by any nation, estimates indicate that the United States has a total of 331 military satellites for intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance, while the Chinese are estimated to have a total of 290 military satellites. For decades, the United States sat comfortably as the most important space power in the world. But the mystery Chinese space plane is just the latest indicator that Beijing is beginning to close down the gap in the race for space dominance. 
14 people were killed and 25 others were wounded in the Czech Republic's worst mass shooting on the 21st of December. The attack took place in the capital Prague at the Charles University's Faculty of Arts, which is close to the major tourist sites like the 14th century Charles Bridge. The unprecedented violence sparked evacuations, a massive and a quick response from the security forces and warnings for people to stay indoors. The gunman, a 24-year-old student, shot himself when confronted by the police. He is believed to have killed his father at a separate location earlier in the day. Struggling to come to terms with the tragedy, the Czech Republic's government declared a day of mourning on the 23rd of December. Our next report gets more details. Prague, nicknamed the city of a hundred spires, is a picturesque city and a major tourist attraction. Thousands from across the world flock to the capital of the Czech Republic every year. This year too, as fresh snow covered the mesmerizing city, people were gearing for the Christmas festivities. But unbeknownst to them, danger and an unprecedented tragedy lurked around the corner. At 13.59 GMT, we received the first information about the shooting in the Faculty of Arts building here in Pilar Square. The first police units were here within minutes. The rapid response units were here in 12 minutes. A 24-year-old Czech student, identified as David Kozak, first shot dead his father at home, then proceeded to kill 14 people and injured 25 others at his university. Thirteen people died on the scene. We have to add the 14th dead to this, which is the gunman, and one victim died in the hospital during hospitalization. Those wounded in the gunman's attack at the Faculty of Arts include three foreign nationals, that is, one citizen of the Netherlands and two citizens of the United Arab Emirates. We have no specific indication of any imminent danger at the moment. The university in question, the Charles University, is the oldest university in Central Europe. In body cam footage released by the police, officers are seen trying to intervene and sweeping the university floor by floor. Frantic scenes of people hurtling helter skelter, holding on to a ledge and jumping were witnessed. Confronted by the police, the gunman, feeling the noose tightening, ended up committing suicide. Previously unknown to the police, he reportedly had a huge arsenal of weapons and ammunition. Quick responding police officers undoubtedly prevented far more serious carnage. Reportedly, police had started a search for the man before the mass shooting, ever since his father was discovered dead in the village of Houston, outside Prague. Though the motive is yet to be ascertained, the gunman is believed to be inspired by a similar case in Russia. In the modern city of the Central European nation, mass shootings are rare. Many, like the ex-faculty member Christina, were left rattled and struggled to grasp this notorious newfound reality. It looks like it's something totally unprecedented in Czech Republic and I think everybody is completely shaken. For us, it's even worse because we are locals and because we are graduates of the philosophy faculty. We go there sometimes to visit. If we had been in the wrong place at the wrong time, it could have affected us much more than just a fact that it happened a few meters away from us. People in Czech Republic can apply for a gun license for the purposes of hunting, sport and self-defense. A background check, keeping in mind the factors such as mental health and criminal history, is done. In addition to this, the applicant has to pass an exam, testing their knowledge of firearm safety and regulation. Depending upon the license category of the gun, minimum age for gun ownership varies between 15 and 21. Also, every 10 years, owners have to reapply and re-qualify for their gun license. 
According to the Czech Republic police records, there are more than a million registered weapons in the country. A shaken and grieving nation declared a day of national mourning to commemorate the victims of university shooting. December 23rd will be a day of national mourning to honor the memory of the victims of this unprecedented gunman attack in Prague. On this day at the latest, Czech flags will be flown at half-mast on all public buildings and we are asking all citizens to honor the memory of the victims by observing a minute silence at noon on December 23rd. A makeshift shrine in memory of the 14 staff and students killed has been growing with people leaving small candles and flowers on the cobblestones. Crowds were seen huddled in the streets, mourning and consoling each other. One can only hope that this tragedy of the worst mass shooting since the Czech Republic emerged as an independent state 30 years ago is a one-off incident. North Korea test launched its most powerful solid fuel intercontinental ballistic missile on the 18th of December. The launch of a Song 18 came barely a day after the nuclear powered submarine USS Missouri made its port in Busan. Even more worrying was the joint US South Korean warning that a nuclear attack by Pyongyang would mean the end of the Kim Jong un regime. A defiant Kim Jong un, though, has warned Washington from making a wrong decision against it. Pyongyang has conducted a record breaking number of weapons tests this year to gauge what it claims is its war readiness against the mounting U.S. hostility in the Korean Peninsula. Our next poll gets more. North Korea first conducted a nuclear test in 2006. Since then, United Nations Security Council has adopted many resolutions, calling on North Korea to halt its nuclear and ballistic missiles programs, but to no avail. Pyongyang has repeatedly said that it will never give up its nukes program, which it considers essential for its very survival. Last year, it declared itself an irreversible nuclear power. This year, upping the ante, it has carried out a record-breaking number of banned weapons tests, including last month's launch of a military satellite. The military satellite, it claimed, was providing images of US and South Korean military sites. And on the 18th of December, North Korea's most powerful solid fuel intercontinental ballistic missile, Hwasong 18, was launched. In attendance was the North Korean leader Kim Jong un with his young daughter, a familiar sight of late. After the launch, Kim vowed to accelerate the nuclear buildup and issued a warning to the US. Hwasong 18 is the largest missile in the North Korean arsenal, which flew just over a thousand kilometers and reached a maximum altitude of 6,518 kilometers, accurately hitting its intended target, an empty patch of sea. It has a potential range of more than 15,000 kilometers, which would cover all of the US. It used solid fuel, which makes missiles easier to transport and faster to fire than the liquid-fueled versions. Monday launch marked the third time this year North Korea had tested a solid fuel ICBM after launches in April and July. Analysts are of the opinion that the launch signifies consistent efforts to improve the technology. Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida condemn the test launch. The launches are not only a clear violation of UN Security Council resolutions, but also a threat to peace and stability of the region, and we strongly condemn them. In retaliation, the next day, the two allies, US and South Korea, along with Japan, activated a system to share real-time data on North Korean launches. The conservative government of South Korean President Yoon suk yeol has made concerted efforts recently to improve historically strained ties with Japan once their colonial masters. On Wednesday, 
The United States flew a long-range bomber, B-1B, in joint drills with South Korean and Japanese fighter jets. This show of strength from both sides is escalating the already heightened tensions in the Korean Peninsula. A misstep and all hell might break loose. Both sides would do well to exercise some caution. The Republic of Sudan, Africa's third largest country by size, has been ravaged by war for the past eight months. The conflict between the Sudanese Armed Forces and the Paramilitary Rapid Support Forces erupted on the 15th of April. The RSF and the Army had shared power with the civilians after the 2019 overthrow of the former strongman Umar al-Bashir. And in 2021, the Army and the RSF joined hands together to stage a coup. But relations soured between the army and the RSF over the planned integration of the paramilitary RSF into the regular army. Since the fighting began in the middle of April, it has displaced more than 7 million people. It has left the capital city Khartoum in complete ruins. It has precipitated a humanitarian crisis and has triggered the ethnically driven killings in Darfur. And now, Sudan's second largest city, Wad Madani, has fallen to the RSF. Wad Madani has been for many months a hub for hundreds of thousands of people who have been displaced by war. But the question is this, will the capture of Wad Madani now mark a decisive turn in this war? The Game of Thrones in the strategically located and agriculturally rich Sudan took a major turn this past week, as winter is coming. The city of Wad Madani, about 170 kilometers southeast of the capital Khartoum, is the capital of the Al Jazeera state. On the 15th of December, residents of Wad Madani woke up to sounds of gunfire and explosions. Previously under the Sudanese army control, Wad Madani had come under attack from the paramilitary rapid support forces. A major aid hub, Wad Madani provided refuge to hundreds of thousands of people displaced from the capital Khartoum and the nearby towns. Its fall on the 18th of December was acknowledged by the Sudanese army the next day, who said that their forces withdrew from positions after the advance of its paramilitary rivals. RSF's entry into the city triggered a mass exodus. Reportedly up to 300,000 people fled the city, with some among them already displaced by the devastating war. These people, uprooted from their homes, were already struggling to find alternative sources of income after losing their jobs. Muhammad Ali, a civil servant internally displaced from Khartoum, has been making sandwiches at a kiosk to sustain himself. The missile hit and the walnut tree was smashed to pieces. The window was smashed too. The car was destroyed. I have chopped and dried the bits of wood and can use them now for Burjouika stuff. In recent weeks, the RSF have gained momentum, consolidated their grip on the West Darfur region, and seized new territory stretching east towards the capital Khartoum. The Sudanese army boasts of aircraft, but has little effective infantry and is in control of eastern and northern Sudan. RSF is a hardened force that grew out of militias the army itself deployed almost two decades ago to brutally suppress an insurgency in Darfur. It has held most of Khartoum since the early days of the war in mid-April. RSF chief Mohamed Hamadan Dagalo alleged that his fighters had attacked Wad Madani as a preemptive strike upon learning that the army was preparing an offensive on Khartoum. Many people have also fled to the port of Sudan, where the situation was perceived to be more stable. Since the city is not under the direct influence of the conflict, but in the port of Sudan also, the influx of refugees has overburdened the local shelters. 
We have been plagued by all kinds of diseases since we came to the shelter. My aunt died at the shelter because of a heart attack. Another relative was sent to another city for treatment. Many people here are sick, but there are no professional doctors. The food is scarce and adults have to give most of their food to children. Even prior to the conflict, about a quarter of Sudan's population was facing acute hunger. The deteriorating security situation has only imperiled the lives of thousands trapped. Both the generals Fatah al-Burhan and Hamadan Dagalo have been positioning themselves as saviors of Sudan and guardians of democracy. In a country which has experienced only brief democratic interludes, this latest conflict not only diminishes any hopes of a transition to democracy, but has created a humanitarian crisis which is only worsening by the day. Without a wrap on this edition of World at War, and if you want to reach out to me with any comments, feedback or suggestions, please feel free to do so on the ID that you're seeing on your screens. I'm your host, Mohammed Saleh, and I'll see you again next week. Beyond is now available in your country. Download the app now and get all the news on the move.